so many Christians get obsessed with is the um, the 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 atonement and and the the significance of Jesus' death for our sins and that all our sins are wiped away. And that's a very important theme in in one John, especially in uh, chapter one and two. Yeah. And of course, that's really central. But now I've come to see that, that that's really a means to an end. And that end is relationship with God. It's fellowship with God. It's community with God. And in chapter four, verse one, first you have this beautiful picture. God is love. And if you're in love, you're in God. And God is in you. And I think that is the like the kind of ultimate goal for John. It's divine fellowship. It's fellowship with Father, Son, and Spirit. Um, God is in me, and I'm in God. Well, Colin, thank you so much, sir, for joining us on the podcast. Welcome to Faith in the Folds. Thanks for having me, Kevin. It's great to be here. Yeah. So for folks who are familiar with uh, with you, your work in biblical studies, they'll know uh, your work with Paul. They'll know, I think, your work also with, uh, with some Greek language stuff. But uh, help us generally, for folks who are not in biblical studies, help us generally kind of get to know you a little bit. Where are you these days? Uh, what are you up to? What mm -hmm. are uh, what are some things that uh, that we can look for to help us uh, get to know you a little bit better? Sure. Well, I'm living back in my hometown of Canberra, Australia, which is the capital city of Australia. Uh, after um, six years in living in Chicago, where I taught at I taught New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and prior to that seven and a half years uh, teaching at Moore Theological College in Sydney. Um, but um, back on my home turf, um, kind of reconnected with my extended family. <clears throat> I'm spending most of my time writing. Uh, I've got a number of projects going on and playing jazz and uh, teaching a little bit at the Australian National University. Cool. So cool. that's me in a nutshell. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for folks who are interested, because I, I know I've got a few music lovers who enjoy the podcast as well. When you say playing jazz, what particularly do you uh, do you play, and what kind of jazz do you enjoy? Yeah, well, I'm a saxophone player, um, and I trained uh, professionally before I got into theology and ministry and that sort of thing, and. Um, Ever since then, I've been playing at a professional level, kind of on the side in Canberra and Sydney and Chicago uh, and various places around the world, I guess. But um, I play mostly modern jazz or bebop and beyond, for those who know what that means. And uh, yeah, you know, I love to play. It's, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful gift from God to be able to create music and especially with other wonderful musicians um, with whom we form a, a beautiful bond, a kind of fellowship, if you like, Yeah. Um, as we make music together. So, yeah, I've been, uh, I've been fortunate enough to catch uh, occasional videos, video clips here and there of you playing. And even though modern jazz and bebop, not particularly what I'm normally drawn to, as a fellow saxophone player, we're talking before we started this, I, I grew up on alto and then you know, switched over to, to Barry sax pretty early on in my, in my uh, career <laughs> as a saxophone player. Um, <clears throat> I can appreciate uh, you know, talent and expertise when I see it. And so it's, it, it's been fun getting to know you uh, through that lens as well. Um, my, I, I tend to gravitate more towards... Um, or towards some of the old standards, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, you know Duke Ellington, Count Basie, those guys. Sure. Uh, yeah. You know, talk about Barry Sachs. I mean, Harry Carney, the guy who played uh, Love Barry Harry Sachs Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington. Yeah. I think it was his personal driver too. I, oh, really? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. I had to do. I had to do a, re a report for jazz band in high school, and it was print off 
something from the internet about <laughs> this person and then present that with the yeah. class. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So I jazz well, uh, jazz you, instructor was a bit of a rogue, and so that that counted for what we needed to do. <laughs> did you um, did you master the circular breathing on the baritone? The I way never that Harry could. Carney no, could? I I tried it a yeah. few times, that's, and I that's like, hardcore. I just don't. I don't know yeah. that. I don't know that this is going to be really beneficial for me because <laughs> you know the most I'm going to do a, is college. A, a party <laughs> yeah. trick. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, yeah. Just off the top of my head, do you happen to know the name? Sorry, this this is way off topic, but I I, I think this mm -hmm. I, I'm gonna forget it if I don't mention it now. Do you happen to know the jazz twin uh, duo Roland and Rashawn Barber? Have you heard those guys before? No. Okay. All right. No. They they went to my high school. I thought maybe you had heard them. Maybe we could you know make a connection there. One plays trombone, the other plays saxophone. Um, if I okay. think about it, I'll I'll look them up on YouTube and send you a message or something. Just they've, they've gone on to other things, I assume. I, I think that they school. are professional. Yeah, I think that they play professionally. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, well, there are a lot of great players out there. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? So, but we're not here to talk about jazz. As uh, as fun as it would be to uh, to riff on that for a little bit, a little music pun for you. We are here to talk <laughs> about uh, the Jahanin epistles. And so, um, you know, and, and for folks who are listening in the audience, you, you might have heard in this episode and in episodes, uh, you know, earlier with folks, especially like Paul Anderson, who uh, uh, the episode on the Gospel of John with and some other folks, this word Jahanin is simply the way that we use to describe something from John. And so for the sake of the audience, I wanted to, uh, wanted to mention that. Let's talk about these, uh, these works uh, first, second, and third John. Help us understand mm. them a little bit. What's their What's their genre, and um, mm. what does that tell us about how we should understand or interpret, or what kinds of things we should look for in uh, mm. first through third John? Well, first of all, as an Australian, I'm more inclined to call them one, two, and three John rather than <laughs> okay. first, second, third. All but right. I'll, I'll try to adjust culturally for 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 you and the audience yeah um but uh yeah, you know actually in my bible it's just got a one and a john so i think one john is technically more accurate you know i've got an niv right <laughs> here and it says one john four that might be there sbl format is, too. so we're gonna uh, roll with that <clears throat> i'm just kidding but yeah uh these are wonderful parts of the new testament and uh, one john especially or first john especially is is quite profound and and theologically significant for the teaching of the new testament um second and third or two and three john are probably among the most neglected parts of the new testament mm -hmm. and uh, they're also the second and third shortest documents in the new testament in fact three john not only is it the only three uh, book in the whole Bible, it is the shortest book in the whole Bible. So, and also on the surface, I think two and three, John, if we, if we talk about those first, yeah. um, on the surface, they don't seem to contribute much more beyond one, John. And so they're a quick read, an easy read. And a lot of believers, I think, will go up. Oh, okay i'm not really sure why that's there maybe it's just because it's written by john and they included everything they could get from the apostles but otherwise you know it doesn't contribute much yeah. i think that's um an unfortunate perspective and if you look a little more carefully and think a little more deeply about those two letters they actually do make their own contribution mm -hmm. but the contribution is overshadowed and dependent on on one john and uh, these all three letters are designated as letters, although only two and three John are written like letters. Yeah. And so one John in particular really does not have any of the marks of a of a typical letter of the Greco-Roman world. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a greeting. It doesn't have addressees. It doesn't mention an addressor. Right. So normally letters begin with hi this is so and so i'm writing to such and such yeah or hi such and such i hope you're well and then with a sign off you know um so one john doesn't have any of that and 
It doesn't have any personal references at all. Right. Uh, and so it's a really weird document. Um, I think most commentators do not regard 1 John really as a letter, though it functioned as a letter, meaning we do believe that it was sent out sure. from the author to its recipients. Mm -hmm. But really, you know, if we're going to designate its genre, it's more like a treatise, um, you know, like a, a kind of essay. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that's the best way to read it, acknowledging, though, that it was sent out from an author to its recipients as a letter would be. Well, there's all yeah. this language, too, in, in First John, where it's where it says I write to you and I wrote to you and 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 all this and it uh, on just through a quick read of it 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 is self-referencing as as a written work but you're right there's no opening there's no John mm. to the churches in you know such and mm -hmm. such or anything mm -hmm. like that and, and you're also right to mention no personal references um yeah. can I ask what's you know if if the author's doing this consciously what's the purpose in kind of framing something like this sort of like a letter but it still not actually being a letter well i think it functions as a circular letter okay so um that means that it was most likely written to a group of churches rather than a particular church or a particular individual mm -hmm. tradition and i think whatever evidence historical evidence we have indicates that John spent the latter part of his life in Ephesus on the west coast of modern Turkey and uh, was buried there, been to his original burial, burial place. Um, and there are a number of churches in and around that region in west, what is today Western Turkey, what was once known as Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this letter was probably circulated uh, among those churches that helps to explain the lack of personal references. At least it, it, it explains the lack of personal references with respect to the addressees, but yeah. it doesn't explain the lack of personal reference to the author mm -hmm. who was presumably known to the readers. But I think um, one suggestion, which I uh, am inclined to adopt about one John is that it kind of theological treatise that it is the major themes John Paul. Uh, I think I was, I'm just. I it froze just for. I think you are frozen just for a second. I can still hear okay. you. Oh, there, okay. there you are. Okay. Uh, I think I think All you right. had. Uh, you're in the process of kind of explaining how it was a. a theological treatise and yeah so okay. I, I, I can trim some of that, that stuff out. yeah 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 so i think one john was written to be a, a theological treatise dealing with the major themes that john's gospel deals with mm -hmm. so in a way it, it kind of functions like you know if you take the theology of the major themes in john's gospel and and, and extract them out of the narrative and out of the story form that it's in um, you could arrive with something like one John, yeah. Um, but it, it's kind of impressing those themes, those theological themes, in a pastoral way for John's readers. Yeah, yeah, almost like a um, yeah, like a pastoral reflection on yeah. on the Gospel of John. Yeah, I, I I read through it to right before we we got on, and yeah, there's all this discussion about you know light and darkness being mm -hmm. in him knowing him eternal life all yeah. of these themes are just you know that that saturate the gospel of yeah. john yeah yeah that makes that makes perfect sense to me yeah i almost wonder uh you mentioned um, earlier before uh, a, a bit of technical difficulty there um for those who are kind enough to watch we had to trim just a little bit because of the uh, of a fuzzy connection but i was going to ask you were talking about how there's no real personal connection with the senders. There's also no uh, or no personal connection with the sender and also the uh, the recipients. Uh, compare, say, for example, Paul's letter 
Uh, I think I think Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I think Paul is. I, th- I think mm. you make the strongest case for Pauline authorship. I had Lynn Kohick on uh, uh, earlier mm. in the in the series on the New Testament. She argues mm. for Pauline authorship, uh, and so mm. that, that's kind of how I operate. There's not a lot of personal touches in Paul's in, in that letter no. for the recipients, but okay. for Paul the sender himself, there are by way yes. of contrast. There's plenty, especially in chapter three. Yeah, yeah, yeah a, lot, a lot more, and so I, it makes sense to me then to see something like this, First John, as mm. as you said, a, a treatise or a, you know, maybe a summary reflection or mm. something along those lines. Yeah, mm. uh, that, that makes perfect sense. But, yeah. but also, why, why, since you mentioned Ephesians, and and I'm not sure if Lynn holds this view. I don't, not sure that she does. But um, I also think that Ephesians was most likely a circular letter as well, mm-hmm. um, in that it was intended to be sent probably to uh churches in the similar geographical space that john's letters were written if not even the same churches Mm -hmm. uh in asia minor because the the original text the the earliest manuscripts of ephesians chapter one exclude an Ephesus in in ephesus Mm -hmm. uh and also there are there are no personal references to the recipients Unlike Colossians, which is very similar, as you know, to Ephesians, which yeah. is full of uh, references to personal recipients, even though that's a church Paul never visited. Mm-hmm. But for Ephesus, you know, Paul Paul lived there for three years. And so it's really weird yeah. that he doesn't refer to anybody by name. And I think the most likely explanation is, like one John, it was sent to a variety of churches in and around Ephesus mm-hmm. in that region. And so that helps explain the, the tone and feel of both Ephesians and 1 John. And so yeah. that's something that the two letters have in common, I yeah. think. We actually did not get into that with uh, okay. Dr. Kohick. And so I'm glad you brought that up. Could we, it's kind of a tangent, but could we could we chase out some things with that uh, a little bit? Yeah. Going back sure. to the jazz, jazz metaphor, could we improv on that for a little bit? No, let's riff uh, on it. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, <clears throat> So you mentioned the content of Ephesians is Mm. in many ways very similar to the content of Colossians. Mm. Uh, There's a strange reference in Colossians to a letter to the uh, Laodiceans or the Laodiceans, Mm. if you want to give a more Mm -hmm. Greek accurate pronunciation. Mm. There's this reference to another letter Mm. that we just simply don't have. We don't have it, yeah. Some people think that maybe the letter that we now know as Ephesians is yeah. this mysterious missing letter to the Laodiceans. Yeah. What's your take on that? Can you kind of walk us through that really quickly? And it's all relevant because John is obviously sending something to people in the same area. So that's how, I'm gonna, that's how I'm going to justify it. That's relevance. how we're going to justify this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And I'm writing a commentary on Ephesians. So I'm just. Oh, go that's right. Anything. Yeah. That's right. You had mentioned that when I, when we, uh, when I pitched this to you. Um, I think it, it's possible. Um, I think you have the same problems that you face with Ephesians, which is if this is a church, um, a specific church that Ephesians is written to, why does he not mention anybody? By name, even with Colossi, he'd never been there, but he knew lots of people from there because it's a church that radiated out of his ministry from Ephesus, only a hundred miles further to the west. So, and and Epaphroditus, who delivered the letter uh, to the Colossians, was uh, it seems like a, a product of Paul's ministry in Ephesus. So that there are already um, relationships that Paul, at least people that Paul knows about through Epaphroditus or through his Ephesian ministry who are in Laodicea, um, Hierapolis, uh, sorry, who are in Colossae, Laodicea is, is very close to Colossae. You know, it's in a, a three city triangle yeah. with Hierapolis, uh, and Colossae. So, if he knows people in Colossae, why doesn't he know people in Laodicea? And therefore, why aren't they mentioned in Ephesians? What I think is most likely is that Ephesians was written to a variety of churches in that area. And it may well be that Laodicea was one of those places and that they did receive a copy of the letter called known as to the Ephesians. And that's what is being referred to in Colossians, but I don't think it would be written to them specifically, okay. but they would have received it as one of those many churches in, in Asia Minor at the time. Yeah, yeah. I, 
sounds perfectly reasonable to me. And uh, it's something that maybe not a lot of folks are uh, are aware of. Um, mm. I don't know. I don't know the average person who uh, who attends church somewhere is aware of maybe that that issue with the phrase in Ephesus mm. is is not in some of the earliest manuscripts that we have of letters mm. uh, to the Ephesians, like you had mentioned. And then when you stop and think about, you know, and have them, Paul's statement, you know, and have them read the letter to the Laodiceans as well. You mm. know, I, rarely does somebody pipe up and say, well, hey, no, wait a second. Where, I don't have that. Where is that letter? Yeah, yeah. it's like that, that, that's not in the back of my Bible anywhere or anything. So, okay. That's well, right. I, I'm glad yeah. we're able to, to chase that a little bit because we didn't really mention that in, uh, in mm. the earlier episode with Dr. Kohick. So I, I mm -hmm. appreciate you mentioning that. All right, so we've got, um, we've got, uh, first John is kind of a, a pastoral mm. reflection compared with second and third John, which uh, appears appear to be proper letters, you know, proper uh, uh, yeah. letters. Is, is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. You know, there is an addressee for two and three John, and there's a, a, um, a addressor. There's a yeah. Now they're they're all a bit vague because two John. Uh, just has two um, to the chosen to the lady, lady, <laughs> and her ch and her children, and then it's signed off by the elder. Right. Um, yeah. Like the and they're supposed to. We um, can presume that they know who that is. Uh, three John, perhaps ironically, is the only one that's. Most lighter because it's actually a drew guys, uh -huh. um, and an, an individual in an individual person with an actual name. Mm -hmm. So even even to John, though it is structured by a letter, it still has some of that serioso feel. Like who is the elect lady? Um, and right. <laughs> I, I think it refers to a church, the church that, that John is addressing. Um, but some commentators have argued that no, it's actually a a, a woman um that that john sure. is writing to so yeah there's still and, and that sort of mysterious feel is very much part of john's writings to be honest and this is why they're uh, i love that because it, it's so evocative but uh, many people find it quite frustrating because um john is 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 just harder to follow than paul and a lot of people say well wow paul's really hard to follow sometimes uh, i agree to a point but but Paul is sort of always, nearly always arguing in a kind of linear fashion in an argument. Okay. It's like, okay, you believe point A. Well, then point A plus point B equals point C. And so you can follow this linear progression with Paul. And even though some of it can be confusing and, and much of it is debated, at least you can follow the train of thought. You know, yeah. with John, John is kind of like this in all his writings. There's yeah, like it, this circularity. Yeah. Yeah, a spiral, a circle, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it means it can be very difficult to follow. And, and especially if you're used to thinking of arguments in a linear, logical way, John just doesn't do that. Right. Instead, I think, and, and, and if you try to pin John down in that way, you will just get frustrated. And if you try to preach John in that way, uh, you know, if you're a pastor and you want to preach through especially one John, mm -hmm. you will find it frustrating and find it quite difficult because yeah. the same things keep coming up Right. and repeating with slight differences so do you preach basically the same sermon every other week uh, no. you know but <laughs> yeah. with tweaks like yeah. how do you how do you tackle yeah. that but i think the answer for me personally is that um john is operating much more like a, a painter or an artist or maybe even a musician yeah. where he is kind of playing with images mm. and ideas and he's sort of if you think of him more as a a painter with a repeated motif or a musician who plays the same, we've been using the word riff a lot, yeah. but using the same riff mm -hmm. um, with slight variations each time, then you, you start to get a better handle on what he's doing. Theme and, and variation. The effect of that, yeah, you could think of it that way. Yeah, exactly. And the effect that it has, like if you're listening to music or if you're observing visual art, is it, it makes an impression on you. It doesn't make an argument so much as it makes an impression and it makes you feel something um so, so john is impressing something on his readers uh, yeah. and i think he's he's a master of using these images 
Uh, we see it in John's gospel as well. He, he uses these incredible images, many of them derived from the Old Testament, but instead of doing like what Matthew does in quoting a lot of scripture, he uses a, a, an image like the Passover lamb um, that everyone has a mental image of that. And then he paints that image into his gospel, you know, so you see it and you go, oh, that, that makes an impression on me. I, I know what that is. You know, yeah. and so John John's letters, he, all his writing is shaped in this kind of way, rather than a linear, progressive kind of way. Yeah, yeah. Would it be just to kind of help us get a get a clearer sense of of maybe contrasting sort of what say Matthew and Luke are doing with what John yeah. is doing? Could you say that for the sake of analogy, Matthew and Luke are writing in a more uh, what we might describe as academic sense versus John is, is writing more artistically. It, it, uh, is that kind of a fair way to, to pitch that? I, I find that a helpful distinction. I mean, I, I think um, Luke especially is writing like a, a Greek historian like Thucydides or Herodotus, especially Thucydides. I think Luke has him in mind. Mm -hmm. A sort of an orderly account this is his way of saying, I'm writing real history. You know, I'm writing things. I've got sources and witnesses and I'm putting all my ducks in a row and I'm going to present it. And he does it in a, uh, he does it in a, shall we say, calm sort of manner that's reflected even down to the, the choices of words that he uses. Uh, he's, he's not a flamboyant writer. Matthew is sort of academic from a Jewish perspective. Right, yes. In the sense that he's sort of saying, he's a scholar of the scriptures and I'm going to present a case that Jesus is the Messiah from the scriptures themselves. Yeah. And, and so for the Jewish reader, it really resonates very yes. strongly. Mm -hmm. um, whereas John, I think you're right, like he's the artist and he's, he's painting with images, many of which are, as I mentioned before, derived from the, from the Old Testament. And he also wants to demonstrate that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. But um, he's... He uses flamboyant language. I mean, even when you drill down to the to the Greek verbs he uses, he uses flamboyant verbs. Um, and and uh, many commentators note the kind of flash and sparkle that hmm. John's language has. He also uses very simple phrases, very simple vocabulary. Yeah. Um, and that that uh, for for higher critics of 150 years ago, that would. They would look down on John for that reason, but actually think, no, this fits with his kind of approach that he is using um, simple phrases and sentences and vocabulary choices with really deep meaning. Mm. Um, and this is the way the artist works. It's like you might see a simple image, but the more you ponder that image, the more profound it is, you know, and the more impact it has on you. You know, and, and John is, so you should never despise John for his simplicity. He is not, he's simple, but he's not simplistic. Yeah. There's a, there's a, mm -hmm. That's good. a way in which he can be understood at a surface level quite easily, but at a deeper level, the more deeply you dig into John, the, the more profound he becomes. Yeah. It, it's like a bottomless well of truth. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, fascinating too. I have uh, I've just started reading *The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe* with mm -hmm. my five-year-old at night. Okay, and mm -hmm. I I mean I I watched those old BBC movies as a kid that we checked out from the public library, <laughs> um, you know, and I mm -hmm. I read them in high school or, or college, and you know, I read them as an adult. And now reading them with him, mm -hmm. after hearing my brother-in-law and how he like his kids, my niece and nephew, their reactions to it. And mm. it's very similar way. I'm going back through and thinking, my goodness, this, there's so much depth here mm. in what appears on the surface to be a rather simple story. A yeah. A children's fairy tale. Yeah. 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 Very yeah. true. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that resonates with me very much. So I had, I had not thought of John also as kind of an artist or a musician, but that, that really does make a lot of sense. And it, I, it, honestly, it helps me appreciate kind of what mm. John is doing, not just in his gospel, but also in in uh, First John yeah. as well. Yeah. We mentioned some of these themes that um, that John is drawing from the gospel traditions, putting uh, you know, kind of reflecting on in especially First John. 
Mm-hmm. What are what are a couple of these major themes that we see, especially mm-hmm. in 1 John? Um, we've mentioned love. We've mentioned eternal life, knowing him. What are what are some of these, and, and how, how does he kind of tease some of those out? Yeah, I'd say the three biggest themes that resonate between 1 John and John's gospel are truth, love, and Jesus, mm. specifically Jesus as the Christ. Mm. Um, that's a big theme, both for the gospel and for the first letter. Um, John in the gospel, uh, you know, uh, kind of climaxes in chapter 20, where he says, you know, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, or as D.A. Carson argues, that the Christ is Jesus. But with whichever way, you know, um, it, it's ultimately showing that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the King of Israel, the one that the scriptures point to. Um, and one John is dealing with that issue in a pastoral way because there are false teachers already uh, around yeah. the end of the first century mm-hmm. who are denying that Jesus is the Christ or denying that Jesus came in the flesh or ultimately undermining Jesus' messianic status. Yeah. And they are the ones that John calls the Antichrists. Right. Yeah. Um, and the Antichrist is not, you know, the, the sort of demonic kind of 10 head headed beast of revelation, or uh, they're simply people who deny that Jesus is the Christ. They are anti the Christ. Yeah. And the, the picture that you get from one John is that these are people who were with us. They were among us. They were card carrying, you know, followers of Jesus who at some point, became dissatisfied with the church's teaching about Jesus or no longer believed the last seeing apostle who's John um, and said, no, 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 Jesus is, is not all that. And they've, they've left, they've created some sort of schism. They've taken people with them. Um, It's a kind of church split, it seems. Uh, And John is saying that's, that's heresy. I mean, he's not using the word heresy, but that is a, a distortion of the truth and if you get jesus wrong you get everything wrong and this is one of the major contributions of one john if you get jesus wrong you are lost yeah because it all hinges on him and mm-hmm. so they, there's there's nothing more important than that and that's a massive theme again put into pastoral application by john um but taking one of the themes from john's gospel and applying it pastorally truth and love same sort of thing the truth is found in jesus and uh, if you know Jesus, you know the truth. It's one of these circularities that go on. And love is bound in there too, because you can't know the truth without loving people. Um, and if you love people without the truth, it's not really love. Yeah. So truth and love must be held together, a lot like Paul in, in Ephesians 4.16, speak the mm-hmm. truth in love. Uh, and so often, I think that's so pastorally relevant, because so often today and throughout the ages, Christians fall into the trap of prioritizing, say, the truth, and they're very unloving with it, and they become very judgmental, and the truth without love is, is, is kind of dangerous, even though it's the truth. By the same token, others fall into the trap of prioritizing love, but without truth, and so we're all love. God is love. You know, John says that twice in this letter. God is love, and that's a wonderful thing to say, but it's not an amorphous kind of love right. without any defini- definition. Um, again, that that God who is love is a God who can only be known by Jesus, who is the Messiah. Mm-hmm. So if you reject that Jesus is the Messiah, then you don't really know the God who is love. Mm-hmm. You know, um, So the truth, truth and love have to be held together. So they're the big themes. Um, Jesus is the Christ and truth and love it's like a package bound together and some subsidiary themes that come out of that are fellowship and you see that right at the beginning of the letter yeah that john writes these things that you may know our joy and and there's a sense that john is um including his readers into the joy of the apostles by knowing the truth about jesus and so there's a relational joy john is again it, it's a contrast from paul John is not trying to simply persuade people of the truth and have them believe it. Not that Paul, that's a caricature of Paul, but you know what I mean? He's like, here's this argument, you know, get with it. 
And whereas John is like, like saying, look, we just want you to join in on this party we're having. We want you to share in our fellowship together because it's truly joyous. And it's nothing less than fellowship with the Father and the Son mm-hmm. by the power of the Holy Spirit. So share our joy, make our joy complete by, by being in the truth on these yeah. matters. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Man, there. Uh, there's a ton of good stuff in there, and uh, I hope we can unpack a little bit of that. Uh, let's let's rewind just a bit. You mentioned one of my favorite um, things to say in Bible classes that blows people's minds, unfortunately. I asked the question the other day uh, in a class that I was teaching here at church. What are the two books of the Bible where the word Antichrist occurs? And everybody in the room knew it was the book of Revelation, and they couldn't yeah. come up with the other one. They're like, actually, guys, it's not the book of Revelation at all. And they're like, yeah. no. It's like, look it up. Yeah. <laughs> Pull out your phones. Turns out the Antichrist is precisely as you described. The Antichrist is this not this cosmic boogeyman, right? Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a figure who denies... Jesus is God's son, but denies that Jesus has come in the mm-hmm. flesh. One mm-hmm. way that I know for a fact, because I've experienced this myself, and my experience is normative, right? <laughs> One way that I've experienced this for um, in, in growing up in church is that people will often say that this is uh, this kind of notion that jesus did not come in the flesh is evidence of what is called early gnosticism Mm -hmm. i think gnosticism is a term that a lot of folks are familiar enough with where we don't have to go into a lot of detail about it is that a fair description of of what you think is going on here and and could you kind of unpack that for a little bit yeah and in particular uh, I do read it as an, a, a, an indication of the first Christian heresy, mm. um, which, yeah. is a, which is a part of Gnosticism called docetism, mm-hmm. which is from the Greek word dokeo, which means to seem. And so it's re- very interesting. By the way, just this has great apologetic value for, for anyone who's got sucked into the whole like Dan Brown conspiracies or anything like that, yep. that said, you know, the church invented that Jesus was God in the third or fourth century. That's complete rubbish yeah. because the first heresy, um, and this is happening before the end of the first century, um, did not deny that Jesus was God. It denied that Jesus was man. Yeah. The assumption yeah. was that Jesus was God. Right. So historically, right. there's very early, I mean, in the New Testament itself, but but very early uh, accounts of the assumption that Jesus is God. What they were denying was that Jesus was really a man. He only seemed like a man. That's why it's called decedism from the Greek word, okay, or to seem. Um, and um, the New Testament is very clear that if Jesus is not a man, if he's not really human, then he's not able to redeem us. And I think you see hints of that in 1 John as well, like in chapter 2 where uh, it says that Jesus is, uh, first of all, we have an advocate with the Father in verse 1, and he himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only yeah. for us. You have to ask, how can he advocate for us if he's not one of us, mm-hmm. right? How can he represent us in that way if he's not truly human? There are all kinds of things, and, and also in, in Paul, I think, where the theology just falls down yeah. if Jesus is not truly a man. So, um, yeah, I think that is part of what's going on i'm not totally convinced that john's opponents in this letter can be nailed down to one specific theological problem or heresy but that's definitely in the mix yeah the denial that he came in the flesh yeah 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 and and so what we have here then is um a couple of helpful corrections one a, a theological or maybe more technically correct a christological correction yeah yep mm-hmm. understand correctly the nature of jesus yeah. And then a, a correction for us, uh, uh, for you know, 21st century readers of the Bible would be this Antichrist, this word Antichrist, it, I don't think it means what you think it means, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're it, using that word that I do not think it means. What you <laughs> exactly, think. yeah. Yeah. This, uh, this figure is, uh, is not what, um, you know, not what you've heard. It is, 
in some ways it, it's less scary, right? It's, it's less cosmically scary, but mm. in other ways it, it hurts more because there's a personal touch to it. These were people yeah. who were part of our group. Like you said, they, they were card carrying members, right? They yeah. were part of our group and they, and they left. You called it a church split. My, my, my church tradition it has, has many good things. One of our bad things is a propensity for church splits. You know, yeah. if the Lord can use that to plant a church somewhere else, uh, you know, by God's grace, we'll, we'll go. But um, I, it, describing it as a church split, man, that, that hurts. That hits home. Yeah. But I, think the, I think you're right that that's, that's what's going on here. Yeah. Yeah. And in a way, it's, um, it's, it's harder because, like you say, there are personal relationships involved, but it's also more dangerous because it's harder to identify. Oh, yeah. You know, a great cosmic boogeyman with 10 heads is pretty easy to spot. <laughs> like, okay, that thing is evil. Yeah, I can right, tell yeah, that yeah. just from looking at it. Yeah. But, um, you know, your friend who you know and love, uh, who's been in church with you for 10 years or 20 years, who starts to take, starts to deviate from the Christological truths of the Bible, then you know, that's, it's difficult, it's painful personally, but also it's, it's harder to spot because they don't look like a, a boogeyman. They're not a boogeyman. They're just someone who has come to a point where they um, are actually denying the truth about Christ. Yeah. 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 The big themes in first John, truth, love, and Jesus, all things, mm. like you said, that we can very clearly see kind of uh, weaving their way in and out of the gospel of John. Um, second and third, John, any, any, any real highlights there that we could, that we could turn to? Um, yeah. There's, there's this character that I want to ask you about when we get to third, John, um, <clears throat> Diotrephes. Yes. We, we can get to him in a second, but uh, sure. generally speaking, Things in the second and third John that we can look at and say, okay, you know, here's here's how he kind of tracks this notion. Yeah. Um, well, well, second John or two John. Um, so I'm using the it, American idiom. I, yeah, no, 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 it's yeah. fine. It's um, uh, it's been suggested that two John actually functions a little like a cover letter for one John. Oh, and okay. yeah. I, I would I tentatively accept this hypothesis. Okay. Um, it's hard to know for sure, you know, sure. but it, but the theory makes sense because it picks up on if, if the major themes of one John are truth and love and mm -hmm. Jesus two John is about truth and love. That's the whole ball game. Yeah. The whole letter is about truth and love. And obviously Jesus is right there in the center as well. So um, one John in a way is, is a summary of, sorry, two John is a summary of one John. And if it's got, it's actually written like a letter. So the elder to the elect lady and her children, this could well be a cover letter for the treatise, which is not really a letter. So it comes, it came with a cover letter and um, it's a little vague to the elect lady, but I think the elect lady means a particular congregation, a church. So that's a way of writing to a range of churches with this cover letter, right? Because every church is the elect lady. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, without specifying, you know, in this location or that. Um, and it, it introduces the major theme that we're going to be dealing with. And then you, you go on to read 1 John. Yeah. So I, I'm quite fond of that theory. Again, you can't really prove it. Um, but um, yeah. It'd be great if we could find a, an ancient codex pretty early, right? Early second century, right? So like uh, rivaling, rivaling the, uh, you know, the the little fragment of, of the gospel yeah. of John in terms of dating. And it has, uh, it, it has what we would call second John right on the top of yeah. what we call first John. That'd be nice. Um, we, well, I think there is something like that. In one of the manuscripts, but I, I, I don't have it to hand right now, but oh, there, there's, there's some manuscript kind of evidence that supports the theory. Oh, yeah. that is cool. That is cool. Yeah. Uh, also something interesting too, that I, I hadn't noticed before until we just started to start talking. Um, reading on Paul's letters has made me or like understanding Paul as a letter writer has mm. made me p pay more attention to the openings of letters mm -hmm. you know part of oh, my yeah. studies uh, part of yeah. my studies part of my doctoral studies at asbury were to um 
We're to really dig into epistolography. And that is where I found the great works from Randy Richards mm -hmm. on Paul's work. Uh, Paul's a letter writer and Paul's use of secretaries and things like that. And I I read a lot just of you know, regular old ancient letters. And for the sake of the audience, something that is really instructive for us understanding the letters in the New Testament as mm -hmm. letters as mm -hmm. opposed to like instructions for churches and things like that, is just to read ancient letters. You know, yeah. whether, whether they're from, you know, from some of the, the premier letter writers of the ancient world, like Cicero, or mm -hmm. whether they're found in trash heaps in places like uh, Egypt. Mm -hmm. It's helpful for us to do that, uh, all of which you know, but again, for the sake of the audience to, to kind of help us compare some of this stuff. Yeah. In 2 John 3, John opens up in a way that's very similar to Paul, Mm. Paul usually says something along the lines of grace and peace. Mm. And this word That's grace in Greek sounds very similar. Again, I know you know this, but for the sake of the audience, grace, the word in Greek, grace sounds very similar to the traditional Greek greeting. So the difference is charis, grace, and chirene, you know, greetings. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that here, I hadn't noticed this before, but John starts off in essentially the same way, grace and peace. Yeah. Also kind of making me wonder, you know, is John aware of Paul's letter writing conventions and, and does he adopt this? Mm -hmm. Do you go into that in your in your commentary on, on these letters? I don't go into the connections with Paul, but okay. it would not surprise me at all. And I also see a number of connections with Peter. Um, okay. Especially one Peter. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's historically implausible that John was aware of those letters. John was around for a long time. You know, he's around until the 90s. Mm -hmm. And he's writing and living in a place where Paul's letters have been circulating for nearly 50 years, Yeah, some of them. Yeah. So if, if anything, it'd be more implausible to suggest that John didn't have knowledge of Paul's letters. Yeah. And of course, we know that Peter had knowledge of Paul's letters, as he mentions in right. 1 Peter 3. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, I think, yeah, they're probably, uh, he's probably aware of earlier writings for sure. Or he's aware of Paul's writings. And I think if anything, that just underscores where they're similar, like in a greeting, like in verse three. Mm -hmm. um, yep. He, maybe some borrowing has gone on there or some influence. Mm -hmm. uh, and where they're different, you, you just see John's mind independently doing what he's doing in a way that's in contrast to Paul, complementary to Paul, but yeah. not Paul. Yeah, very true, yeah. very true. So you mentioned, obviously, um, you know, or some of these things that we see kind of tracking through, like, you know, mm -hmm. Second John as functioning sort of like a um, like a cover letter for First John. I, I, that idea makes sense to me. Um, and you, you obviously hear Second John 4, it has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth. Oh, goodness, this notion of the truth. Here we go again. Uh, you know, walking in the truth, uh, which was a common Jewish idiom for, for how one conducts their life. Um, right. You know, again, this uh, de describing a new command, um, you mm -hmm. know, describing love, describing obedience to his command, mentioning Jesus in the flesh. My goodness. Yeah, the more I just track through Second John, then I'm like, oh yeah, man, cover letter, sign me up, I'm in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and even just look at the first, the very first verse, the elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, right. yeah. and not only I, but also all who know the truth, yeah. because of the truth that remains in us and be with us forever. That's in the first two verses. Yeah, yeah, At, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm in, you've got me. <laughs> um, let's turn to Third John. Because I want to sure. ask, John and Paul both are not afraid to call people out from the pulpit, so to speak. Yeah, man. Uh, when I was preaching, when I was uh, working on my doctorate at Asbury, so right there in Central Kentucky, worked for a little church. They were really good to us. Uh, occasionally, felt like it would be appropriate to call some people out from the pulpit. You know, I'm down in South <laughs> Texas these days, and uh, so we're sitting here joking about you know Second John or Two John. We could just call it yeah. Dos Juan down here, and everybody would uh, everybody would roll with that. But there's <laughs> times, you know, when uh, when it's appropriate to call somebody out from the pulpit. Yeah. John and Paul yeah. don't have a problem with that, and John has done that very thing here in a uh, Third John, verse mm. nine. 
Mm. What is the deal with Diotrephes, and why why do you think John mentions his love of being first? Mm. Yeah, good question. Um, the scholars love to uh, speculate about this. In I'm short, asking you to speculate sure. away. <laughs> yeah, in short, I don't think we can know anything firmly. Mm. But um, it, this is one of those cases where, oh, what, what's really interesting about all of John's writings, the the Gospel of John 1, 2, and 3, John, and just leaving Revelation aside for the moment, mm. if you accept that John wrote Revelation, which I do, mm. um, is that they are self-informing and they're mutually informing. They're mutually informing. And two, one of the things we didn't talk about with 2 John is that 2 John puts this truth and love thing into pastoral application and says, and this is counterintuitive for us, don't show hospitality to false teachers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we, we would jar it with that and go, wow, that's really, that's really sounds a bit unloving, but that's where the truth comes into play because it's like saying, you know, if you show them hospitality, um, then they are able to do their ministry here because they're probably traveling preachers mm-hmm. and the hotels and inns at the time were not safe to stay in. Yeah. Uh, and so Christian missionaries relied on hospitality from churches. Yep. So by saying, look, these people are teaching untruths about jesus if you show them hospitality they're going to come to your town and they're going to lead all these people astray Mm -hmm. so the best thing to do is to to not show them hospitality as hard as that might sound so that their message is blunted now uh in three john if you just read that in two john in three john you see someone who may fit that description with Diotrephes. He's someone who does not receive our authority in verse 9. He loves to have first place uh, among people. So that seems to be a condemnation of his character to yeah. some extent. Um, but ultimately, what we see is that he's someone who set himself against the apostle John and therefore apostolic authority and everything that that represents. Um, and um, you see some of the damage that one of these yeah. false teachers is able to do. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, some scholars have suggested, oh, it's an early church bishop. You know, uh, I don't think there's any evidence for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So well, and my my, my tradition is, is pretty low church. We're a congregationalist, and so um, yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't go to to bishop as the first option anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, maybe that's why he's a bad guy, right? <laughs> we can roll with that yeah um kind of near near our time here um let me ask uh maybe on a a more personal note what is you know maybe one of your favorite go-to passages from Mm. this collection called the Jahanine epistles what's something that that you turn to and think man yeah this is this is the good stuff yeah uh, there's so many great one-liners uh especially in one John. Um, I think uh, at a previous stage, my favorite would have been, say, uh, chapter 2, verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Mm-hmm. But, but now I think I would go for something like chapter 4, verse 16, the second half. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. Mm-hmm. And let me just explain why I think that for me now trumps chapter two, verse two, you know, like as a younger Christian, th- this is something I think that um, so many Christians get obsessed with is the, um, the, the, the atonement and, and the, the significance of Jesus' death for our sins and that all our sins are wiped away. And that's a very important theme in, in 1 John, especially in uh, chapter one and two. And of course, that's really central. But now I've come to see that that, that's really a means to an end. And that end is relationship with God. It's fellowship with God. It's community with God. And in chapter 4, verse 1, first you have this beautiful picture. God is love. And if you're in love, you're in God. And God is in you. And I think that is the like the kind of ultimate goal for john it's divine fellowship it's fellowship with father son and spirit um god is in me and i'm in god and that that of course parallels paul's 
theology of union with Christ, where it, it's a little more Christocentric in Paul. I'm in Christ and Christ is in me by the Spirit. But ultimately, I believe it's all getting to the same thing, that we have a fellowship with God. And that, as I mentioned at the beginning of the letter, is what John is really writing for. Make our joy complete, that you have fellowship with us and with the Father and with the Son. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's what I love about 416 there. I have been, um, I've been watching my five-year-old kind of navigate the difficulties of kindergarten. Mm. Buddy, it's only going to get harder. <laughs> but, um, but I've been, I've been watching him navigate the, navigate the difficulties of kindergarten. And he is, because we moved last year, uh, still during the pandemic, from mm -hmm. his friends in Kentucky, he was born in Kentucky. He you know, had had his daycare buddies, and then we moved down mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And he started his you know preschool, but is now in kindergarten. So it just hadn't had time to. You know, he hadn't had four years to build up the same friend group. He had a few months here and then a few months there. Mm -hmm. and this is a young man who is very understandably hungry for companionship, mm -hmm. and. You know, if, thankfully, he and uh, and our two-year-old, his little brother, they get along incredibly well. But it's interesting to watch him, you know, very innocently manifest all the difficulties of trying to make friends, of, you know, trying to understand sort of how to deal with it with friends. He was a little bummed out today because somebody had pushed him in line or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And watching mm -hmm. him sort of wrestle through all that. I, from as a 35-year-old who's you know, been pastoring at churches now for several years, I can see all that stuff play out in adult lives, and there's so many times where mm. the, the thing mm. that would make the most difference is you know, deeper union with God through Christ, empowered mm. by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. and closer communion with your brothers and sisters here in church, because then you would have the network. You yeah. would have the network in place that mm -hmm. could really help you walk through these difficulties that inevitably we find ourselves in, uh, whether they're on a, uh, on, a, uh, on, a, on a world scale, like mm -hmm. a pandemic or, or something as, as personal as, you know, divorce or infidelity or you know, death of a loved one or something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Before we wrap up, if you have time, could you briefly tell us about your In Pursuit DVD series? Because mm. I, I wanted to mention that earlier, but I, I neglected to. It's a, it's a great series. Could you tell mm. us one kind of yeah. what you've done and then where folks can find that? I'll have a link in the description below as well. Yeah, well, first of all, it's um, available on YouTube now for free. Uh, In Pursuit of Paul uh, was the first one we did. And it's a seven part documentary, docuseries, yeah. travel log type thing, mm -hmm. where basically I retrace Paul's steps and really try to reflect on the significance of what Paul did and said mm -hmm. and taught in those places. We have some beautiful drone footage of places, yeah. uh, remarkable. Um, all these places I never visited before. So for me, I was experiencing them for the first time and really trying to think through for myself and sharing with my audience, you know, what these places meant to me and also how it affects the way I read Paul now. And I have to tell you, it really does affect the way that I read Paul now. Yeah. Um, not just so that I can imagine what Corinth looks like because I've been there or Ephesus or whatever, mm. but actually to understand that Paul's letters are artifacts in a life story and paul is he's living a story he's he's got a story going on you know which is presented for us in in acts but also in bits and pieces in paul's letters themselves mm -hmm. and those letters are artifacts of that story they're, they're products of that story they, and they uh, mean certain things at different points in that story and so you can't really appreciate all that you might about Paul's letters if you don't have a good sense of that story. So we really try to present that story in In Pursuit of Paul. Uh, we did the same thing with In Pursuit of Peter. Mm -hmm. um, and there's lots there that people, I think most people don't know that, that Peter traveled through Turkey and, and Corinth and, um, you know, uh, 
they usually do know he ended up in Rome, but to, to explore that apostle's significance and the things that he wrestled with. We've also filmed In Pursuit of John. So we've yeah. been speaking of one, two, three, John, mm-hmm. um, but also dealing with the gospel of John and Revelation. That hasn't been released yet. Uh, it's, it was completed a couple of years ago, um, but the, um, the publisher is not releasing it yet. And okay. I'm not sure when it will be released, but it will be released on YouTube. Okay. So I'm very, okay. very pleased with the response. In Pursuit of Paul and Peter together have had about a million views, uh, nearly 2 million views on YouTube. Um, yeah. So Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we bought, uh, you know, for, our, for our use uh, with churches, we bought uh, In Pursuit of Paul and In Pursuit of Peter. Uh, when I was up there in Kentucky, thoroughly enjoyed them. They were a big hit with uh, cool. with our folks and uh, appreciated the discussion questions along with them. So, um, Great. Con, thank you so much for your time, sir. I, I appreciate you tuning in with us all the way from uh, from the land down under. And it has been a treat to be able to talk to the, the Jahanim pistols with you, sir. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Kevin. I've enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.